And there is my bio, and uh, as you can tell, I'm a lifelong Louisvillian, went to St. X and the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I am an architect, historian, and author. I've written about 20 books on Louisville architecture and history, um, and various other awards, and I am retired, thank goodness. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about African American history of Louisville. And you may be saying, Steve, what qualifies you to talk about African American history of Louisville? Well, here's my acknowledgments. Here are some of the folks that I have consulted with, I know, and have learned from on this topic. Blaine Hudson, I'm not sure if y'all know who Blaine Hudson was, he passed away about 10 years ago. Great historian, U of L professor, wrote the book 200 Years of Black History in Louisville, which I'll talk about later, but he and I were good friends. I knew him a lot. Martina Kanucky is a really good friend of mine. She's an African-American historian. I consult with her on a regular basis. And then all the other folks that you see here that I have dealt with. And I consider my Sam, myself a Sam Plato uh, uh, historian. I'm not sure if you know who Samuel Plato is, but we'll discuss that in the presentation. I've done a lot of research on him. And then I've done a lot of projects in the African-American community. Primarily the Whitney M. Young Jr. birthplace out in Simpsonville. I'm not sure if y'all know who Whitney M. Young Jr. is. He unfortunately tragically drowned in the 1960s, but he was very similar to Martin Luther King. And he was from Simpsonville, uh, Kentucky. Uh, very well-known African-American leader in the same mode as Martin Luther King, but unfortunately due to his untimely death, he didn't really live through the civil rights era uh, as it unfolded. But I uh, restored his birthplace house out in Simpsonville. Uh, I did the uh, headquarters building for the Lincoln Foundation. Some of you may not know what that is, but it's an African-American academic organization. They fund scholarships for Af African-American students. Uh, I helped uh, find the site for the Central High School football stadium. Won't go into detail on that, but uh, that was very important to that community. Park Duval, uh, uh, Smoke Town, Family Health Center, a lot of clinics and healthcare for the African American com community that I've been involved with over the past 20, 30 years. So anyway, just a little bit about my credentials on speaking about this topic. So let's start at the beginning, when the first African American came to this area. Um, the um, George Rogers Clark was on Corn Island at the time in the late 1770s, 1778, 1779, and the historian George Yader wrote a book called 200 Years at the Falls of the Ohio, and in that book he talks about an African American slave who was a musician. His name was Cato Watts, uh, and was, he was a violin player and played to the uh, uh, troops and settlers there on Corn Island. The problem with that account is, to our knowledge, we cannot verify that Cato Watts ever existed. But we do believe that African American slaves were part of that settlement, but to our knowledge, we're not exactly sure where George Yeager came up with Cato Watts due to our research. But anyways, African Americans were here at the very founding of Louisville. Talking about slaves, uh, of course, Kentucky was a slave state. Uh, here's a, a historic marker in downtown Louisville that talks about um, in the year 1800, uh, there were 40,000 slaves in Kentucky at that time. Uh, and then talks about uh, all of the, uh, what it made up 24% uh, of the Kentucky population in 1830, slaves did. Um, Runaway slaves was a big issue here in Louisville, especially because of our proximity to the Ohio River and Indiana. It was easy to go across the Ohio River back in those days prior to the uh, navigational changes that the, nowadays you'd have to swim across the Ohio, but back in those days you could almost literally walk across the Ohio in the, during the summer months. And so there were a lot of runaway slaves in this area due to that. And uh, here are some more um, markers related to that. This one marker on the left talks about some slaves that escaped here from Louisville, found their way up to Canada, and really made a nice existence for themselves once they got into Canada. Uh, they made a nice career. I think they started a taxi service up there with a carriage. So anyway, some interesting things there. And then over on the far right-hand corner, they're, they're starting to develop this uh, memorial to those 
slaves who didn't quite make it across the river. Some of the slaves unfortunately drowned in the river, and it's called the Unknown Project, in which they talk about uh, slaves that didn't make it across the river, or some that may have made it across. So they're putting some memorials down along the Ohio River that acknowledge the, the slaves that escaped to uh, freedom. Here are some uh, values of slaves, and again, look at these prices. This is 1834 for value of slaves. Um, this 21-year-old uh, man was valued at $800 in 1834. I have no idea what, I should have done the math of it for you, but that was a lot of money in 1834. Probably thousands of dollars. And then again, we talk about sale of slaves there on the right. Slave trading again, another marker. This is in downtown Louisville, uh, talking about that. Uh, we were sending slaves down the river between 2,500 and 4,000 a year, I think that says. And uh, yeah, it's just a horrible, horrible enterprise. Talking about the slave traders. More slave ads from the early uh, 1800s. The Arterburn brothers, they were notorious slave traders in Louisville. Uh, they had the slave pens down near 2nd and Main Street. They had a huge like jail set up in which they kept the slaves in uh, before they sold them down the river. Just a horrible uh, institution. And uh, there you can talk more about that. Um, Farmington was a slave plantation. Some of you may have been to Farmington out on Bardstown Road near the Waterson Expressway. Joshua Fry Speed on the left there was the owner of Farmington. On the right, of course, was Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln came here in the uh, uh, July, August of 1841 where he really encountered the slave trade on a personal basis and really impacted him going forward into his presidency, he realized there was something that had to be done about that institution. Uh, down on our waterfront, we put a, a memorial not too long ago to Lincoln, because Lincoln, again, he, when he arrived here, he came in on the, on the wharf, and he saw slaves being sold down the river, saw them in chains, and Ed Hamilton, the sculptor, created this memorial with showing uh, slaves being shackled here and going to down. And uh, this uh, little inscription on the far right talks what Lincoln says about how it impacted him uh, when he came to Louisville to visit the Speeds. Across the river in New Albany, Indiana, was Town Clock Church. And that steeple, it's very tall steeple, it was a beacon to the slaves. So they could see it from the Kentucky side. They knew that's where they needed to go once they crossed the river, go to the Town Clock Church. Because on top, up here was the worship space for the congregation, but down below is where they kept the slaves, they treated them, got them nourished and all, and got them prepared for their trek up to Canada uh, to escape all the slave uh, hunters that would be following them. The Town Clock Church was on the Underground Railroad and still exists there, and uh, they have a great... Uh, program talking about the slave trade. Over in Jeffersonville, Indiana, they've got markers as well talking about um, slaves that have crossed the river over in the Jeffersonville area. Talking more about the Underground Railroad here in Jeffersonville. Uh, Oxmoor Farm out on uh, Shelbyville Road behind Oxmoor Mall. Uh, it still exists. Let me see, here's Shelbyville Road right here. There's Oxmoor Mall. You go back, and there's a lane that comes across here, and at the very far end is the Bullet Homestead. It's called Oxmoor. And uh, Alexander Scott Bullet was the owner of that, and he did have slaves on that uh, plantation as well. Some of you may have seen this room here. This is part of the Oxmoor Farm. I've actually given lectures in this room here. But uh, it's a huge library that's part of the farm. But right adjacent to it are slave cabins that are still existing there today. In downtown Louisville, they had slaves. And this is the Howard Hardy house. It's down on 2nd Street near Chestnut. And on the front was the master's house. And on the back side were the slave quarters, the servant quarters. 
John E's, Bill Bowens, and the Heights House. Has anyone been to one of those restaurants, John E's or Bill Bowens? Well, the Heights family owned slaves. And uh, a number of years ago, they closed the restaurant and they tore down uh, this house that you see there. And when they did so, we historians are saying, oh my gosh, they're tearing down the house. We know that the Heights Family Cemetery, which was right adjacent to the house, that the slaves were, the slave burial grounds were nearby. And so while they tore it down, we had the excavation company to go around, and we tried to find the slave grave sites, but we could not find them. We had them do some trials around to see where they might have been buried, but we could not find them. Slave cemeteries are very difficult to locate because usually they did not have a headstone like Europeans would have had. Uh, they usually just put a stone there, hardly any reference at all that they were buried there. In fact, there's an apartment complex not far from where we're sitting here today, just down Cannons Lane, that uh, uh, the, the apartment complex goes around in the middle is a park-like space. And in that park is the slave cemetery. But most of the people in that apartment complex have no idea why that little park space was saved. A friend of mine, he goes around and he tries to find slave cemeteries. And he helps mark those as we, as we identify them. Uh, but a lot of African Americans are buried in regular cemeteries. Uh, Louisville Cemetery is an African American cemetery there on Poplar Level Road at Eastern Parkway. A lot of very famous African Americans are buried there. A uh, listing here of several of the folks. Where is the cemetery located? It's, on, uh, it's at the corner of Eastern Parkway and Poplar Level Road. Oh. Eastern Parkway, Poplar Level Road. It's a pretty big cemetery. It goes way back in there. It's next to St. X, right? Uh, it's almost adjacent to St. X High School. Eastern Cemetery, another famous uh, African-American cemetery. We've had tours of that. Uh, it was originally called the Methodist Cemetery back in 1842 when it started, but African-Americans were allowed to be buried there, unlike adjacent to Cave Hill. Cave Hill did not allow African-Americans to be buried there till the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Um, the Lewis and Clark Act Northwest Expedition, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, they had a, a slave, uh, William Clark's slave, York, participated on that uh, expedition and was very valuable to the uh, expedition because the Native Americans, the Indians, uh, thought he was so unusual. They had not really seen an African American before. And so he was very valuable to them as to a somewhat of a curiosity to the uh, Native Americans. A lot of the early jockeys at the Kentucky Derby were African Americans. In fact, on the very first Derby, Oliver Lewis was the jockey on Aristides, and we're getting ready to celebrate the 150th run for the Roses in May, and the, uh, as you can see, the first number of uh, jockeys were African American. Why did they stop being African-American jockeys? Jim Crow laws. In the early 1900s, the Jim Crow laws came in and uh, prevented the uh, African-American jockeys. Um, the founder of the uh, Kentucky Derby was uh, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., who was the grandson of William Clark, the explorer. So the uh, grandson, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., founder of the Kentucky Derby. He served in the Confederate Army, and the Clark family owned slaves. President Zachary Taylor, a lot of Louisvillians don't even know that we have a president buried here in uh, Louisville, but anyways, um, uh, the Taylor family owned slaves as well. It's kind of controversial whether or not Zachary owned the slaves or his brother owned the slaves, but suffice it to say there were slaves on the uh, Taylor uh, farm there in eastern Jefferson County. It's all Blank and Baker Lane. Now then, uh, we've had some uh, monuments removed here locally. Uh, this was the Confederate monument, which was removed down to Brand Brandenburg, Kentucky. Uh, again, the Confederate uh, monument was not uh, very well liked here locally due to its uh, uh, history. 
My recommendation, instead of relocating the uh, monument to Brandenburg, my recommendation was just change out the soldiers on it. Instead of Confederate soldiers, put Union soldiers on there. That would have been a lot simpler solution to this, unlike what happens, and I won't get into it, but there's some ugly things that go on down around the Confederate monument in Brandenburg now, due to some of that history. I won't get into that. Now, I've been involved very much with the Castleman statue, and some of you may have heard of the controversy over the last few years about Castleman, and I will say that most of what you've heard is incorrect. His career has been badly misrepresented. Uh, he, in fact, was a very much good friend of the African American community. Uh, yes, he was in the Confederate Army for about two and a half years, but he also served in the U.S. Army as a general. He was only a major, and even then it was a pretty minor role that he had in the Confederate Army. But Castleman was a general in the U.S. Army. He was actually a veteran of foreign wars. He was down in the uh, Spanish-American War there down in Cuba uh, in the late 1800s. But uh, he kept the parks integrated while he was alive. While he was president of the uh, Parks Commission, he allowed Af African Americans and whites and everyone, whoever wanted to use the parks, it was free and open it, during his lifetime and during his uh, uh, tenure there. In fact, after his death in 1918, 19 legendary African American leaders praised Castleman in 1924 for keeping the parks integrated. So six years after his death, eight years after he was on the Parks Commission, the African American community praised Castleman for his efforts on their behalf during the Jim, horrible Jim Crow period. And, uh, and so uh, they wrote this beautiful letter and they praised Castleman in there. So in 1924 is when the parks were segregated. Again, way after Castleman died and all that. So who were these legendary African Americans that worked with Castleman and others on the parks? So one was um, a Bond, James Bond. He was the grandfather of Julian Bond. You may have heard of Julian Bond down in Georgia who was a, either was a state senator or a U.S. senator. I think he was a state senator. But anyways, he was the grandfather of Julian Bond. James Bond was. And he was a major leader here locally on African-American causes. Harvey Russell, the Russell neighborhood you may have heard of. He was an academic uh, uh, educator and uh, he worked with Castleman. I. Willis Cole, very important person in the African American community. He wrote a uh, newsletter called the, uh, what, the Louisville Leader, and it was a forerunner to uh, other African American publications here, but he was very outspoken against the uh, Jim Crow laws of the day. So Willis Coe, James Bond, Harvey Russell, they all praised Castleman for his efforts on behalf of the Af African American community during the Jim Crow period. And then, uh, last but not least, I want to mention William Worley. Uh, William Worley uh, fought against uh, uh, segregation in housing. And I'm not sure if you ever looked at your uh, real estate deeds when you bought your house. I know on my deed it said this, but in, on my original deed of my house, which was built in the 1920s, it said it could not be sold to African Americans. And uh, Willis, or, uh, William Worley filed a lawsuit against that and battled it and uh, fought and got a legal action against that sort of uh, disclaimer in real estate law. Uh, Simmons College, a very major uh, African American uh, university in the sort of Limerick neighborhood of Louisville. It's uh, on uh, 7th Street near Kentucky, if you know where that's at here in Louisville. Uh, Simmons, uh, started out as a, uh, a Bible or a training of black preachers, if you will, uh, black pastors for their uh, African-American churches as how Simmons originally started. And nowadays it still exists and uh, does great work, but they educate all types of career paths now, not just uh, for African-American pastors, but uh, all sorts of technical skills. Here was a um, excavation from one of the buildings there. And two uh, um, 
legendary figures associated with Simmons University was Charles Parrish Sr. and Jr. Uh, Charles Parrish Sr. was the head of Simmons for many years, and then his son also worked at Simmons, but then uh, transitioned, became the first black faculty member at the University of Louisville in the 1950s. And they lived in this house here. It's on 6th Street near Kentucky. And this was Louis, the original owner of this house was Louis Silbach, the Silbach Hotel fame. That's why it's called the Silbach Parish House. But the, uh, after Louis Silbach moved out, he, mo uh, he moved over on Alta Vista, Louis did. Once he moved out, the Parish family bought it and they lived there. Um, the original site for Central High School was here, also near 6th in Kentucky. Um, this uh, Simmons College now owns this, and they uh, use it, I'm, not, I'm sure they use it as a classroom building now, but that was the original home for Central High School back in, uh, it says 1873 is when that started. If anyone has any questions as I go along, feel free to raise your hand. Now then, Samuel Plato, one of my heroes of architecture here in Louisville. Plato was just a phenomenal person. Not only was an architect, but he uh, was a design builder. He constructed the buildings as well. He actually was from Alabama, down near Tuskegee, Alabama. He was from Wa, Alabama. W-A-U-G-H, Wa, Alabama, which was just to the east of Tuskegee in southern Alabama was where he originally was from. And he came up to Louisville to go to Simmons College. He wanted to be a black preacher or pastor of a church, is what his original intent was. But Plato's uh, whole family, his father was a noted craftsman, construction, builder type person, and Samuel had those skills as well. And so when he got to Simmons, the Simmons people needed some things done, some additions, some various modifications to their buildings. Samuel had the skills to do it. And so once he got into that, he said, hey, you know, I'm more skilled at doing building design than I am preaching. And so that's what he ended up going into. And uh, here are some of the buildings that he designed. The upper right-hand one is at Simmons. Uh, this one is up, I think, up in Indiana. A number of these are in Indiana. This is his actual house on West Muhammad Ali where he lived. Uh, a few years ago, I helped put up a historic marker for him that talks about his history. He designed many homes in West Louisville, prodigious house builder in West Louisville, built some beautiful homes there for African Americans. And his perhaps his most well-known landmark here locally is at uh, 13th and Broadway, the Broadway Temple AMEZ Church that he designed. In fact, one of the stained glass windows has his name on it. They actually put his name there in the stained glass. And here was the interior of it. Now then, uh, so after Plato was here in Louisville, after he graduated from Simmons, he, he moved up to Marion, Indiana. And he thought that he would have a better career up in Indiana in Kentucky. So he moved to Marion, Indiana, and they have a number of um, Plato buildings there, and they have historic markers on him as well. Marion, Indiana is north of Indianapolis. Some more information here about Plato up in Indiana. But look what happened next. This blew me away when I learned this when I was doing my research. Plato, uh, Plato ended up running afoul of the Ku Klux Klan in Marion, Indiana. I did not realize it, but Indiana had a lot of KKK members there. What did it say, like 250,000 Hoosiers were in the KKK? Did anyone know all that history? That, that they were that? Yeah. And so uh, he knew that he could not stay in Marion any longer. And so around 1920 or so, he moved back down to uh, Louisville. But yeah, very sad uh, history there uh, of that in, in the state of Indiana. Uh, one of the saddest tales was this one here in Marion, Indiana, which probably really 
uh, confirmed his good decision to come back to Louisville. They hung several uh, uh, African Americans there in Marion. By the way, I also want to mention uh, um, Castleman, who I talked about was good with the app. He did numerous nice, um, I won't say nice, but numerous things for the African American community. And one of them was preventing the lynching of blacks in Louisville. Um, there were two African Americans that were jailed in downtown Louisville for a really bad offense, and the Louisvillians wanted to hang them. They wanted to go down to the jail and drag them out and hang them on the streets. The jail guards abandoned their post in downtown Louisville. Hey, we don't want to deal with this mob. We're getting the heck out of here. So Castleman, with his Louisville Legion, which was the forerunner to today's National Guard, he had about 100 or so uh, guard members with him. They went down to protect the jail and the African Americans. So he was up against over 1,000 mob members who wanted to raid the jail, drag the two African Americans out, and hang them. But Castleman stopped them. You know how, I, with just 100 men, how did he stop those 1,000 mob members? The day before, he got a Gatlin gun. He hunted, put it out there and said, who's first? That's how Castleman did it. So again, he was a friend. He valued African-American friendship and uh, did things of that nature. But down in Marion, Indiana, very tragic tale there. Um, African-American churches, uh, this was the second African-American Baptist church down at, I think it's, yeah, it's first in Market. It's now called Green Street Baptist Church on Green Street. Uh, this is Quinn Chapel, AME, a very historic uh, African-American church. It's down a Ninth and Chestnut. It's getting ready to be renovated, and uh, Martin Luther King spoke at this church on several occasions. One interesting thing a lot of Louisvillians aren't aware of, in, on October 30th, 1870, there was a major incident in downtown Louisville where several black uh, men boarded a, a streetcar and sat up front. And the uh, streetcar conductor said, oh, no, you don't. You've got to sit in back of the streetcar. And they said, no, we're not. We're going to sit up here. They ended up getting thrown into jail, and a major lawsuit transpired after that, and the long, long story short, the black uh, men won the lawsuit to where the streetcars were desegregated. If you look at this, this photo was from 1920 that you see here, you see African Americans sitting up front, way before Rosa Parks broke the transportation bus system. So we had desegregated uh, trolleys and streetcars here in Louisville. A lot of people are unaware of that. What, excuse me, Steve. Yes. What, year, what year was that? I didn't catch that. Okay, uh, the uh, incident happened in 1870. 1870. Se 1870, correct. Well, yeah, yes, go ahead. When we went to buses, were they segregated? I just remember a segregation on the buses. Uh, I, what I think happened after the 1920s into the 1930s, the streetcar system was sold and things transpired that resegregated the okay. transportation system. Okay. I think that's, we have it up on YouTube. If anyone's interested in this, go to YouTube and we have a uh, video on that whole issue. But I think that's what happened was the one streetcar system that they were desegregated ended up being sold and several things transpired where they were able to resegregate it under the Jim Crow laws, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> but they were desegregated for a period of time. Bertha Wedley, Wedley, she was the first black, as well as the first black woman, who was a police officer here in the city of Louisville in 1922. Uh, the fire department was, uh, de was integrated in 1954. Up until that time, they had black fire department units and white fire department units. It says the Louisville Free Public Library, but it wasn't exactly free. Um, it was segregated. They actually had several African-American branches of the library. Uh, one of them was the Western Branch. This is the Western Branch. It was down in 10th and Chestnut, I believe, you know, 10th and Chestnut area. And they had the black... Uh, uh, library there. They also have one in the Smoketown area as well. 
But Murray Atkins Walls in, what was it, in 1956 or so, she uh, was a civil rights advocate and she challenged the library as well as the Girl Scouts to integrate them. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, the Girl Scouts put up a uh, marker to Murray Atkins Walls over at their Girl Scout headquarters there off Lexington Road. They installed a marker to her thanking her for integrating the Girl Scouts back in the 1950s. Well, a couple of years later, I get a call uh, from the historic marker people. They say, hey, Steve, we've got an extra marker for Murray Atkins Walls. And we know we installed one over by the Girl Scouts, but we've got an extra one. Wait, what can we do with this? Do you know where to put that? And I said, well, she desegregated the library system. Why don't we put it in front of the library system? If you've ever gone through any uh, bureaucracy to try to get something done, it takes a long time. And I said, boy, to try to get this marker installed in front of the library, what kind of hoops am I going to have to jump through to get that done? So one day, I just called up the transportation department. And I said, go out in front of the library. I put a little flag there. You just put it right there. And it's been there for the last 15 or 20 years. <laughs> and they've not, it, I was just there yesterday, and it's still there. So uh, anyways, but uh, yeah, Murray Atkins Walls, a uh, civil rights pioneer, most of you may have never heard of, but she desegregated the Girl Scouts as well as uh, the library system. Some more markers in downtown Louisville, talking about segregation in Louisville along 4th Street. P.O. Sweeney, Pruitt Owsley Sweeney, very prominent African-American businessman here in Louisville. Uh, he uh, desegregated the park system. As noted, it was segregated in 1924 and was segregated up until the mid-1950s, when it was 1955. So it was segregated for about 30 years. And uh, P.O. Owsley, again, a very successful businessman, had the financial resources to challenge the city of Louisville in court to reintegrate it. He basically said, hey, we as African Americans are paying taxes to maintain these parks, but we can't use them. What's up with that? And the courts agreed with him, and they reintegrated re uh, the parks. Martin Luther King was here on numerous occasions. His brother, I think, was stationed here at a church in Louisville. So he was here on a number of occasions. He was here a lot. A number of black uh, sit-ins at various restaurants. Martin Luther King here. This is 1964. Some more. Uh, 1968 was a pivotal year. We had a lot of riots in the West End. A lot of the National Guard were called out. Some of you may remember those days. I was a little bit too young, but uh, it was a very traumatic period, I'm sure. Fountain Ferry Park. We say it's Fountain Ferry, but if you see how it's pronounced, it's Fontaine Ferry. <laughs> we Louisvillians call it Fountain. But anyways, it was segregated. It was whites only, and uh, African Americans protested it. Uh, then an infamous day in Louisville history, which still has reverberations 50 years later, September 4th, 1975, school busing, uh, major, major issue. I uh, grew up in the Oklahoma, Oklahoma area of Louisville, and I remember this viv vividly, all the anti-busing riot, not riots, but protests that were going on at that time. This was a huge anti-busing uh, uh, rally that was held here in Louisville. Or they had police officers riding on the school buses. Walnut Street. Walnut Street was the vibrant African-American district in Louisville where all the African-Americans had businesses uh, and all their, their movies, uh, movie theaters, uh, drug stores, you name it. These were all owned by African Americans, very vibrant district. Some of the uh, more images of the Old Walnut Street area, how vibrant it was, a gas station owner here. 
So what happened? Urban renewal came in. I call it urban removal, but urban renewal came in. Here's this, this top photograph is the same vantage point as that photograph. They came in and just wiped out the entire black business district and put in what was called the Ninth Street Divide, this huge Ninth Street barrier which separated downtown Louisville from West Louisville. What year was that? Uh, this started in the 1950s and went up into the 1970s, early 70s. So about 20 year period in which they wiped all this out. Uh, one building that still remains is the old Mammoth Life Insurance, which was an African American uh, business. Uh, it's now called River City Bank. They put this metal screen over it, but this is actually what it looked like. That's about the only building that remains from that whole district. And then, you may have seen this in the paper this week, they're working to get rid of the 9th Street Divide. Let's make it more part of the city. Let's, let's get rid of this horrible, huge boulevard that they put in. So this is West Louisville here. There's downtown Louisville there. West Louisville is here. Portland neighborhood is there. The lock system, uh, McAlpin Locks is over here. West Louisville, pretty much here. Russell neighborhood, California, Shawnee, Chickasaw, all the Park Duval areas of West Louisville. So many, it was pretty much an integrated uh, neighborhood back in those days, West Louisville was. You had African Americans and whites living side by side in that area. And so what transpired? Why did most of the whites leave West Louisville. My theory is, and this is a theory, I've not got into the social economic aspects of this, but in 1937 we had a major flood that flooded the entire West Louisville area. Here actually is a photograph of it. Just totally inundated West Louisville. And those individuals who had the financial resources to move out did. That was primarily the white population which left the African Americans living in West Louisville. At least that's my theory as to why the whites fled, quote unquote, uh, West Louisville. Now then, here is a uh, image of, this was just in the Courier Journal about 10 years ago, 2014, the Courier Journal wrote, uh, had this uh, research showing where blacks and whites live in Louisville. Here is West Louisville, the dark blue area, is where 50 to 90, 50 to 100 percent of African Americans live in this district here. The light blue areas are pretty well integrated areas, and the tan, the light tan areas, are mostly white areas. So it's talking about the extreme segregation that we had here in Louisville and still do. Um, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, they built a lot of public housing. But they are now going through and retrofitting all that housing. They're tearing it down in the Clarksdale uh, public housing area. They tore it all down, put up some very nice residential units there. It's now called Liberty Green. Built some very nice homes in that area. So they got rid of that stigma of public housing with these new, more traditional style, classic style houses. Beecher Terrace just recently, they tore it all down and again did the same thing as Clarksdale and put up traditional classic style uh, homes there. Um, African Americans also live in various um, individual communities here in Louisville. One of them is called the Newburgh area. And I was just part of a, uh, an event this past Sunday in which we celebrated the life of Eliza Tevis. Eliza Tevis was an African-American slave in the early 1800s, and she founded the Newburgh neighborhood. And uh, I won't get into all of her life details, but she was very much an entrepreneur. She saved her money. She was very wealthy. She, this is in the 1800s when a black woman trying to do this, you can only imagine what she was up against. But she was able to actually quote, to buy slaves. She bought up to, I think, 80 or so slaves. And she wasn't just so much of buying the slaves, but she was, um, hang on, let me cut that off. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she did buy slaves, but what she was doing was, was to free them. 
She brought them to the Newburgh area and freed the slaves with her own money. But anyways, that was Eliza Tavis, and that was back in the uh, 1800s. Um, sports history, we have a lot of African Americans in sports. Wes Unseld, great Louisville basketball player, Daryl Griffith, Derek Smith, of course, Lamar Jackson. Um, talking about some uh, African American uh, politicians, some leaders here. These were all, this is all out of Blaine Hudson's book on the black history of Louisville, but a lot of legendary uh, black leaders. Georgia Davis Powers was noted. Uh, Harold Howard, I knew him actually. May Street Kid, some of the others. More of uh, important black leaders. Joe Hammond, Woodford Porter, a lot of famous African Americans here. Kevin Cosby, he heads up uh, Simmons College as well as St. Stephen Baptist Church. Very influential black leader today. Of course, Blaine Hudson, great, uh, just, uh, just saddens me that he died at such an early death. I think he had cancer, if I have that correct. Uh, but he died at a young age, just about 10 or so years ago. But he wrote this book, Two, Two Centuries of Black Louisville. Walter Hudson's. Another famous uh, African-American historian, good friend of mine. He just passed away in the last two years. There's Walter there. He gave a lot of talks on African-American history. There's Walter talking to the Louisville Historical League. and We gave him an award a few years ago. And just a great, great person. African-American Her Heritage Center there in uh, West Louisville off Mount Muhammad Ali. These are the old trolley barns where they uh, had the streetcars. They repaired the streetcars in these barns and they converted that into the Heritage Center. There's there, I'm not sure if anyone's been down to the African American Heritage Center, but it's a huge complex. They have a lot of events there. Ed Hamilton, can't say enough about Ed. Uh, he is an iconic, legendary Louisvillian artist. He did the Lincoln statue. This statue that he's up against right here is an early um, figurine of the York statue, which totally turned out different than what he ended up with. But Ed Hamilton, here he is talking down at the Filson Historical Society. But Ed Hamilton, uh, he's now about mid, mid 70s today and still out there doing sculptures. He just did one of uh, David Jones of Humana. Uh, the Louisville clock actually had African-American figurine on it. Oliver Cook, who was a, uh, a jazz trumpeter back in the 20s, uh, he was depicted on the Louisville clock. Where is it now? I was afraid someone was going to ask me that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was taken down about uh, 2015, 2016. I was part of the group that helped get it reinstalled. We got it. Uh, rebuilt back in uh, Theater Square back around 2012-2013. We had it up and running for a few years. Then the city said, uh, due to a construction project, we got to take it away. The city literally came in and cut it up, cut it in two, cut it apart. It was, Humpty Dumpty will never get put back again. But the figurines were still... I'm, advocating to get the figurines put either at the Fraser History Museum or some other location where they could be on public view. But the figurines still exist, but the track and all that is pretty much gone. Didn't they talk about putting it at the zoo one time? Yeah, they've talked, yeah. yeah, yeah. The airport, yeah. Or go there yeah. But we had it up, we, it was up and running, and it looked great, and that is... Wasn't that Barney Bright? Yeah, Barney Bright designed it, that's correct. Why is that the clock is... Gone. What? What happened to it? Why is it gone? Well, more the politics behind it, or why? Why well, was it done to keep that alive? Yeah, uh, I don't know why they uh, decided to get rid of it when they did in 2014 or 15. Um, it's very sad. Put it this way: it took us several years to get it reinstalled. They took it down in less than half a day. No. That tells you how they mishandled the clock and why it will never get put back up again. But we totally went in and re revamped the entire 
uh, operational system and everything to make it high tech. We had computer systems on it. It was phenomenal what, what we were able to accomplish with it. And then the city came in within a half day, yanked it out. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, uh, of course, legendary Louisvillian. He was, this was his boyhood home here. They painted it pink. I take it that's the original color, but I can't believe Muhammad would have lived in something like that myself. <laughs> It's a little offhand comment. But anyway, it's his boyhood home and some of the photographs of him. And this photograph in the lower right-hand corner, I actually took. So we were there at the, de at the announcement of the Ali Center back in the early 2000s. It was 2001, 2002, when he announced they were going to do the Ali Center. It was down at the uh, uh, steakhouse down on West Main Street, and me and my wife were invited. And so we're there, a big crowd of people, and all, all of a sudden it was like the Red Sea, the, all the crowd parted, and here comes Muhammad Ali walking right towards me and my wife. I said, oh my gosh, he's coming right at us. And I told my wife, you stand over to the side. I, I got my camera. I'm going to take a picture of y'all. As, as you come by, I want you to shake his hand, and I'll get a picture of you. So it all worked out well. So he went, came in, and he went to uh, shake my wife's hand. And right when I went to snap the photograph, he did this, stared right at me like that. <laughs> and that's him. He always knew where the camera was at, <laughs> Muhammad Ali. There he is. He was 18 years old when he won the uh, gold medal. Mm. Some more images of him there with the Beatles and the other uh, smoking Joe Frazier, his main combatant. Mm. And then his funeral at Cave Hill Cemetery uh, had to been the, the grandest funeral ever in the existence of Louisville. Just a phenomenal, I'm sure hopefully you all, all viewed it on uh, television in 2016 when that happened. They were throwing all these flowers on the uh, hearse as it went by. It went through most of Louisville, if you will. It went everywhere. They just had crowds all over the place. And um, at his grave site there in Cave Hill, periodically I will drop by to pay honor to Muhammad Ali. And as you see there, someone has put red pet rose petals on uh, the stairs leading up to his gravesite. Periodically, people will still bring rose petals and spr uh, spread them onto his gravesite. Yeah. By the way, the plantings there are designed to attract both butterflies and bees, which, of course, he floated like a butterfly and stung like a bee, but they put the plants there to attract. In fact, just uh, in, in a tree, just uh, above that there, they have a uh, one of those uh, beehive things to attract the bees there. Uh, just recently, the 2020 Breonna Taylor racial justice riots, which, not riots, but protests, uh, which really were a national uh, situation and just really, uh, just bad things happened, if you will. Uh, but I uh, wanted to mention that. That was a major civil rights uh, situation here in the city just recently. And then, on more uplifting notes, um, our police chief is Af African American. Uh, our population percentage, 65% is white and 24% is black, and it mirrors what our Metro Council is. Our Metro Council is 27% African American. So we have a fairly decent balance on that. And there's a lot more development going on in West Louisville. Recently, St. Peter's uh, United uh, Church of Christ built this business center down on Jefferson near, I think it's 11th Street or so in that area. They built that. And then all this other great work going on. Uh, they're building a new hospital in West Louisville, which is phenomenal. That will be opening here soon. Uh, Goodwill is building an opportunity center there. Of course, the Norton Healthcare Sports and Learning Center, phenomenal. They're doing some great events there on a weekly basis. Um, the uh, West Louisville YMCA just opened up a few years ago. I'm still hoping that the old Passport building there at 18th and Broadway, which they started construction on and then had to halt for various reasons, I'm hoping that that will someday get uh, rebuilt. But a lot of great new construction going on in West Louisville, and I'm glad to see all that. And there we go. There we go. We'll end with that. So any questions on that? Thank you.